I don't know how your weekend has gone, but I got to get out and play with a chainsaw yesterday, so that was cool. I did not play with a chainsaw. I uh, worked with a hedge trimmer. It's, that's close. It's like a junior chainsaw. It is. Hedge trimmers can be very dangerous. In fact, last summer when I used my hedge trimmer, I cut my extension cord in half and down near killed myself. I've, I've done that in the past. It's a, Dude, it's... A, <laughs> Uh, lawn, lawn maintenance is actually, um, you know, we're kind of warriors. Uh, I was, yeah. It's only it, for the brave. At the time, I remember distinctly that there was like a thunderstorm coming and I was trying to get it done quickly before the rain hit. Mm-hmm. And yeah. So. But no, so I did some, got up yesterday, did some yard work, uh, got it done, that went out and did van stuff and then went to the movies last night. Um, did not get to go see the movie that I've been pining to see. Uh, maybe tomorrow. Um, Roger wanted to go see the Secrets of Dumbledore. The, um, I guess the Harry Potter spinoff. It was good. It was okay. Was it? it was, I was entertained. Um, what are, what is that? A prequel or something? Yeah. So it's uh, it it's when Dumbledore was a young man, uh, younger man. Um, who's Dumbledore? Uh, he is he in the Harry Potter books. He's like the head wizard. Uh, he's like the grand poopa. Um, is he the old guy? Yes. Yeah, okay, got the, it. Uh, epic Merlin beard. Yeah. Uh, but in this one, he's just he's younger, and they're dealing with a, a threat that's similar in scope to you know the threat that the other bad guy plays Voldemort. But in this one, it's a bad guy named Grindelwald, who's very. Um, so if let me put it this way, if in the original Harry Potter series, if Voldemort is in is somehow um, parallel to Hitler. Uh, and to world like the World War II um, Nazis, then in this one Grindelwald is like World War One era. Um, the Kaiser. Kaiser, yeah. Mm. Um, you know, st- still very uh, a little, still pretty racist, um, nationalist, but not uh, Hitler levels. Mm. But like you know, started like tries to assassinate um, the equivalent of Ferdinand and start World War mm. One. Uh, and so they are up against that. Um, and it really focuses not on Dumbledore, but this other character who is um, a magical zoologist who like goes around and like collects all the animals and studies them and everything. And so mm. lots of cool little critters and stuff. It was fun. Um, yeah. Kind of have some moral reservations about putting money in anything that has to do with J.K. Rowling, just because she's kind of nasty these days. Yeah. Uh, she has her own economy, too, as yeah. far as I can tell. Right. Um, but Roger wanted to go see it. It was, it was fun. Um, yeah. You know, we had a good time. Um, see, we went to the late movie. I fell asleep during the middle of it, but <laughs> cause I'm an old man. <laughs> what time was the late movie? Eight 30? No, nine 45. <laughs> it started like we, we, it started at nine 45. So we didn't get out of the theater until almost midnight. Oh man. Uh, cause you know, you got to go through 20 minutes of credits or whatever. So the movie didn't take off till like 10 20. Yeah. And I'm just like, Oh God. That's kind of annoying. Um, plus I had a hot dog, um, had a belly full. It was yeah. With the yeah, that'll yeah, that pa- pa- power napped, but you yeah. know, got got most of it. So yeah, but no, it was a good time. Did um, Roger get mad at you for drifting off? He like I got the whole elbow in the rib cage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice. that's that's he was. <laughs> I'm, I'm turning into an old man. Like I'm I'm that guy who just falls asleep in movies now. Um, you got you got to catch me before seven o'clock. That's so, hilarious. Um, other than that, how's your weekend going, brother? Uh, weekend was nice, busy. Yeah, but. Um, you know, if there's one thing us, uh, you know, type A's like is having a constructive time. Exactly. <laughs> there's no such thing as busy. There yeah. is work being done. Yeah. Yeah. Check things off that list, bruh. Yeah. It makes you feel good, right? I'm telling you. The sense of accomplishment is real. Um, endorphins, know, man. I don't know about you, but like when I have time where I, I really look forward to quote unquote vacation time when I'm off work, but we don't go anywhere mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I can just do stuff around the house mm-hmm. and not, that's the best. Yeah. That is, that just makes you feel good. Yeah, it does. Um, but you know, sometimes you do have to make yourself sit down and enjoy a nice, peaceful, uh, round of reading comics. I guess we should introduce the show. Uh, we are the Southern Fried Geekery Podcast. As per usual, I am Caleb Alexander McKenzie. Matt Trogdon. And uh, we are once again without our, our buddy Craig here. He is being the world traveler that he is. He actually um, had to go h- handle some family business uh, out in California, so he's still there. Um, don't, don't worry, he's fine. And here's how I know he's fine. I got a text message from him yesterday that was a picture of a like Viking drinking horn uh, mm. that was in the passenger seat of his car. So that lets me know that Craig is he's doing okay. I'm assuming it holds an entire diet Mountain Dew. 
one would think it, it was a fairly you know as far as horns go it was it was rather robust um you know not not yeah. quite longhorn but we're not talking like goat ah uh, yeah we're, we're like this this cow was you know this this cow felt good about himself mm. um, he had his little swagger good for him um in in the end of it was capped off nicely little little brass action mm. so yeah but now he's doing good um this is episode 230 230 matt we we are uh, i mean we just call it here right like this is just the end just tap and go home. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, 230 episodes of this wonderful show that we know and love. If you have been with us the whole time, we thank you. We appreciate you. We've gone through some changes. You stuck with us. But if you're new, um, welcome. Welcome to our little uh, humble show. We're going to talk about a few comics today because that's what we do. We love the sequential arts. We love this medium. Uh, and, and, you know, throughout our week as we prepare just to, you know, do this show, but also just because we try to map out some reading and let each other know what we're we're checking out. Sometimes we like them, sometimes we don't. Uh, but there's no way you can really talk about anything, really, without spoiling a smidgen of it. So we're going to throw down what we like to call our uh, short stacks. Uh, three little comics, give you a brief overview of them before we dive into a roundtable. Uh, but, you know, just gird your loins and prepare for a, a slight bit of spoilation, because it's going to happen. Uh, but that's just part of it, right? Welcome to the show. Uh, you know, it's like Thunderdome, but more wordy. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, Matt, what did you read this week? Tell me three things to kind of set the mood. Now, one of the things, I, well, I just noticed all three of my short stack reads are Marvel. So, that's a thing. I think not only are they Marvel, I think it's more uh, more funneled down than that. From it is like. very more specific than yeah. that. Um, so, Wolverine Patch. Uh-huh. Um, this is issue number two. Uh, the creative team on this is uh, Larry Hama is the writer. Uh Andrea or Andre, I'm not sure which. DeVito is the penciler. Uh, Labine Underwood is the inker. And Sebastian Ching is the colorist. I really love the art in this book, man. It's just, it's just, it's got a very, it's got a very good, um, I'd say the good, the better part of late 80s, early 90s mm-hmm. art before things got a little wacky. It's just got a very good throwback feel to it. I love the way Wolverine is illustrated, specifically Nick Fury. It's just it, it looks great. It's a lot of fun. I really dig this story. So um, I'm, I'm also reading this, and since you just talked about the visuals, one of the things I love the most about it is because it takes place in a jungle, and it's just mm, very flora heavy. Yeah, and like those backgrounds are just lush, and, and I appreciate that. There's some old school Wolverine brutality in this one as well. Um, mm-hmm. there's some very specific ways he kills some people that I remember reading as a child. Fondly. Yeah. I was like, ah. Nothing like the nostalgia of childhood memories of knife knuckles poking Cor- through somebody. Exactly. Exactly. Um, also on my short stack, number 28, X-Force. Uh, writer is Benjamin Piercy. Artist is Robert Gill. Guru FX does the colors. Uh, you know, Benjamin Piercy's done a great job on X-Force. This is you know, no exception to that. Uh, interestingly enough, um, what's going on currently in X Force is one of the backup Cerebros has become sentient and is uh, wreaking havoc to its own ends. Uh, uno problema. Uh, yeah, I wonder. Imagine. So, two things. Number one, you could have ended that sentence as Ben Percy just does a good job. Mm-hmm. Um, I wonder if, and specifically because this is X Force. Um, I wonder if Warlock is going to... Like, that seems like a good person to, to, to fight Warlock. So... We will see. I mean, that's kind of cool. Okay. Yeah. Third on my short stack is the new series X-Men Red. Um, the writer on this is the uh, great Al Ewing. Mm-hmm. Artist is Stefano Caselli. Federico Blee does the colors. Al Ewing, I think, really, really likes writing Storm. Mm-hmm. And he does an exceptional job of it. It seems like at least once per issue, there is a, there's a storm a moment that you're it just I stop yeah. and I'll read it twice. And this has got said moment in it. She is facing off against Vulcan, and Vulcan, of course, is very high on himself and right. likes talking about himself and you know and so on. And so. He and Stormer uh, facing off. And she says, you speak of a fire that burns inside you, a flame dancing in the wind. Inside me, child, is a hurricane. <laughs> and then quickly hands him his ass. 
Now, in this book, are they on uh, Mars slash Araco? Is that where this takes place? Yeah, that's why it's called X Men Red. Okay, because yeah. the Red Planet. Yeah. yeah. Well, then, so that's I'm actually not reading this book, even though I love Al Ewing. I probably should have, but when I saw it at first, I I thought it was going to to kind of focus on some of the actually Iraqian characters, and I didn't like. I knew Storm was like. Storm and Magneto play a big part of what's happening there right now, but I thought it was focusing on something else, so I didn't start it. But uh, since we're only two issues in, I may need to go back and grab this and put it on my Man, list. That um, you know, uh, our buddy Mike Nelson will one hundred percent back me up. Yeah, on endorsing Al Ewing's oh. writing of Storm. Well, he yeah. and I are here. He and I are. You know, we're twins on this appreciation. Yeah. We talk about it all the time. Do you read the latest storm moment? <laughs> yeah, bro. Talk, talk about a dude who just loves comics. Like like Mike just loves these characters. Uh, very oh, yeah. rarely, I mean, very rarely does this man have anything negative to say about anything. But when he loves something, oh, he loves it. It's yeah. great. Just just makes your heart swell up. Yeah. Um, it's almost Mike size because that dude's huge. Like <laughs> <laughs> that, that is just one slab of muscle. Yeah. Um, well, I guess we should have just called this the mini mutant moment because mm. I'm also uh, going to wax uh, a little poetic, a poetic about a X book. I grabbed uh, Immortal X Men number two. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, also a gorgeous, speaking of Storm, just gorgeous Storm on the cover. I think this is right now my favorite Marvel or my favorite X book. Um, mm. Even though it's only on the second issue, so it's hard to say, but it's just really smartly written. Uh, really, really smartly written. So it, the scribe on this is Kieran Gillen, uh, who I'm just a longtime fan of. Mm. I love what that guy does, whether he's doing his own stuff or Marvel. Uh, Lucas Wernick does the art in this book. David Curiel is the colors, and Clayton Cowles does the letters. This is the story of the Quiet Council and their little machinations. Uh, and, and so because they're the, the leading governance of mutants and Krakoa, it ties into almost everything else. But this really is still focusing on what happened on the first issue where Selene uh, is pissed because she's not on the Quiet Council and, you know, turned the gates into a sentient slug creature. Uh, <laughs> that's wreaking havoc. Cool kaiju fight. But um, at the end of the day, it's there's some really great moments between uh, Hope Summers and Exodus that, that I think is really worth reading this. Because, yep. you know, Exodus is just convinced that she's the Messiah. And yep. there's, this, there's this one part where she's saying, hey, like, look. I don't do this. You know, I'm not, does this convince you? I'm, I'm not Jesus. Jesus never killed anybody. He's like, no, this makes you better. Yeah. You're the ultra Messiah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's funny. Um, really, really cool though. Really, really shows you the behind the scenes workings and how, you know, this group of people especially will buck against Charles. Yep. Um, fun stuff. And then secondly, based on the recommendation last week of our brother Craig, uh, I grabbed the Fox number one family values. This is from Archie comics. Um, it's got three stories in there. Really, really cool stuff. Two of them are newer. Uh, you have Midlife Pisces instead of Midlife Crises. Uh, this is the story in line art by Dean Haspel, coloring by Matt Herms, with lettering by Jack Morielli. Uh, fun stuff. You have Back to Back, a story by Vito Del Sante, and line art by Richard Ortiz. Again, uh, coloring by Matt Herms and Jack Morielli did the letters. Then you get a classic story uh, by none other than Alex Toth. So if mm. that doesn't make you want to grab the book, I don't know what to do with you because uh, Alex Toth is Alex Toth. Mm. Uh, but this one, uh, just fun stuff. So it features the Fox. Like, you know, it's just a fun superhero story set in the Archie verse. You get to see his family. You get to see some of the hardships and struggles that they go to. It's it's cool. It's kind of a, and, and the tall story is just kind of a classic story. Yeah. Um, great little three, uh, three story run. Um, fun times. Fun times indeed. And then last but not least is number two. Of a book that I really like. Um, it's called West of Sundown. It is published by Vault Comics. Love them as a publisher. Uh, and this one is written by Tim Seeley and Aaron Campbell. It has some gorgeous art by Jim Terry. And it's colored by Triona Farrell uh, with Crank doing the letters. Um, this is a vampire story uh, set in the Reconstruction era. Uh, featuring a lot of cool different characters that ties into a lot of like pulp classic monster stories. But the long and short of it is this is basically a, a spaghetti Western um, with a vampire. Mm. Uh, so your, your main vampire is this woman who really needs to get back out to the West coast. And again, this is before the West coast is, you know, part of the States. This is right after the civil war. Um, but she was born just outside of Los Angeles, which at the time was part of Mexico. And so she needs to return there to get her earth and her familiars helping her get there. And, you know, shenanigans and sue. They're being chased by werewolves. There's a Frankenstein-esque monster ghoul guy chasing them that wants to murder mm. them. Um, and they, you know, run into trouble in the Mesa. Um, so it's it's super fun. Uh, the covers to these are very much like pulp movie. Mm. Awesome. Uh, very scratchy. Very loose. Um, but it's Tim Seeley, man. Like, Tim Seeley, like, like, he writes really fun, really energetic horror. Um, 
you know, and, and the guy seems to like vampires and writes them well enough that he's going to keep me grabbing them. So nice. Um, lots of good stuff to read. Uh, yeah, once again, we have nothing, you know, our three books. Sometimes we get books that we're less uh, less hyped about than others, but it sounds like this time, um, fun stuff all around. Yeah. Um, before we move on, um, I wanted to kind of get your opinion on something. Uh, this week, a little trailer dropped for an upcoming television show uh, that we get to see kind of our first glimpse of a character that is... So that I, I love, and I don't want to, uh, rel- I don't want to just put her as like a spinoff character, but uh, she it's She Hulk, right? And she spins off from a character that you and I both really, really enjoy. Mm-hmm. I mean, she's the Hulk's cousin. So, uh, you know, I've talked to a lot of people, gotten a lot of opinions on the, just the trailer in and of itself. What did you think? How did that treat you? I love the trailer. Yeah, I'm so looking forward to this. I can't wait. I, yeah, I cannot wait. It's fun. Uh, it looks. It looks like what I wanted it to, uh, at least the tone and stuff of it looks like what I wanted it to. Yeah. She's she's young. She's a young professional. She's got her trying to get her shit together. <laughs> she's, you know, a young attorney. It's going to be interesting, you know, what they do about her origin. Yeah. And I'm also interested to see what the villain is going to be. Yeah. Because um, it's, it's not really clear on, on the trailer. Like it was with the Moon Knight trailer and... It's like, well, who's the villain here? I'm, I'm actually glad about that, though. Yeah, um, I don't, yeah, I'm not, I'm not mad yeah, about it. I yeah. just, I just really, very curious. I want, I, like, they give too much away in trailers these days. So I'm, I'm really happy that they kind of kept it lighthearted. They show you just, just who she is a little bit. Yeah. Um, we got to see Bruce. Bruce is going to take place in this, mm. which you know ties back into her origin. If you know you're a fan of the comics, you know she, she got her powers because she got a blood transfusion from Bruce. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I'm curious to see if they do that, but regardless it's it's fun stuff and i really like that it looks like uh they are using some of the plans for what would have been damage control um that they had had at one time planned on a damage control television series but it got scrapped um and they greenlit another series that that's not even you know it just didn't didn't work yeah um but you get to see some damage control elements in this. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I love those comics. Like I, like I think they're fun. You know, people kind of dismiss them or, you know, they, they haven't been reprinted. People don't love them, but I think they're fun stories. Um, so I, I can't wait. Now I will say, uh, just, you know, talking about it online with folks and stuff like that. Some people didn't, didn't care for the CGI aspects of it. it so didn't, it didn't bother me. <laughs> yeah. It, it didn't bother me a bit. I didn't, I, I don't really see what they're like, and this is just me saying I don't see it. Not that it doesn't exist. I don't see what they're talking about. I don't see the problem with the CGI. Um, and also because it's like we've seen before where, you know, CGI is put out in a trailer and then it doesn't look anything like that in post because they work it. It's not the film isn't done yet. So, I, you know, I don't, I don't have an issue with it. No, I don't have an issue with anything. Her, her transformation looks awesome. The scene where she picks up the guy, <laughs> yeah. literally, yeah. literally picks him up and carries him away. <laughs> I watched that. I was like, Matt liked that. Yeah, like, <laughs> Matt liked that a lot. Nice, nice. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I'm I'm excited. Can't wait to see it. Um, it's gonna be fun. All yeah, right. I'm expecting this to be much more humor heavy than any of the others. Yeah, I, I think I think it has to be. Well, and it, I, I think it will be. I think it'll be more meta than anything than we've seen, other than maybe Deadpool. Um, yeah, I didn't pick up on that from the trailer, but the humor I definitely yeah. picked up on, and which you know was her longest, or most original run was a humor comic. So. Yeah, well, and it broke the fourth wall a lot. Maybe that's maybe I'm 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 expecting it to be that. Maybe more so than what uh, like you said, you didn't you didn't pick up on it. And, and now that I'm thinking about it, like I wonder if I'm reading too much into it. But <clears> because <throat> the comic does break the fourth wall mm. so much, and that's a that's part of the character. I do think there's going to be some more elements, but I think, you know, I think Marvel, especially the Marvel Cinematic Universe writers are pretty smart and savvy about like fan service and playing into the fact that this has become such a behemoth. Um, you know, you've seen the last couple of movies where they've really done a good job about, you know, nodding to the fact that there's an audience mm. uh, watching this, even if they don't come out and say it, I, I think it's going to be cool. And I would love to see that's It's a perfect opportunity for them to do that. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I would love to see that. It's going to be fun stuff. Yep, I'm here for it. I look at you with the millennial phrasing. <laughs> <laughs> my, my work here is done, folks. Um, all right, so we got together, as we normally do, and we picked the book. Fresh fresh off the, the vine. Uh, just reached up. It was succulent, juicy. We grabbed it. We plucked it right off. Uh, and we decided that we were going to read it, uh, you know, together. Not not in, like, the same room, uh, but we were going to read it, you know, for, for this week. And we were going to talk about its merits, find out if we liked it or not liked it. Now, to be fair, as as with most things, 
um, we grabbed this book because we have a lot of faith in it, uh, especially in the creative team, that it was going to be fun. And so, as with most things, we don't want to pick something up that we expect not to like. Uh, and that was also true for this book. So, I am happy to announce that we are going to talk about a book called I Hate This Place. It's the first issue. It's a new story by Kyle Starks uh, with art by Art Yom Toplin and Lee Luridge doing the colors. Um, also, I should mention that it has Pat Bursau doing the letters. Um, so, good stuff all around. Uh, edited by John Mosen. Just <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious because the last the last book by Kyle Starks that we read was a little one shot kind of thing um, that was about a basketball player who lived in a haunted house. Um, did you ever read that book? That doesn't sound familiar. I, well, I spoke about it on the show one time. I can't remember the name off the top of yeah. it. Yeah. Um, if fun fun stuff. Uh, I need to bring that to you then because you should. You, it's it, you'd like it. It's, mm. it's fun. So it, this one is also a horror story. So Kyle really playing into the, the the creepy crawly of things. What did you think about the book? Give me the thirty thousand foot view of it. Oh, I I really enjoy the book. Yeah. yeah, I'm really anxious to see where the story goes. Love the setup. Love the ending. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, same. I, I I found myself laughing out loud several moments uh in this book and it, it was just energetic it was fun now i will I, I i want i want to give some a nod here because as much as i love the story usually when you read the back matter because i actually did read the back matter this time pat myself on the back <laughs> you know when you read the back matter to something it might explain some stuff about the stories or it might you know help you view the story in the lens the back matter in this book just really made this it enriched the story mm. uh so much better to give you an idea of where he's coming from um You know, it actually added something to it, I think, which was really neat. Not that the story was missing anything, but it just, it elevates it so much. So let's kind of talk about this a little bit before we uh, dig into just the meat and potatoes of it. This story starts off, uh, you know, kind of, the the book picks up where there's already something happening. Uh, There is, uh, you know, it's nighttime, it's out in the country, it's murky, there's these guys that are hanging out, they're, uh, you know, it seems like a shady deal might be taking place, and that's because it is. Um, and this uh, individual pulls up in a car, and he gets out. Um, he is obviously, I mean, he's meant to look like a villain, because he does. Kind of got a scarred up face. Uh, and the first thing he does is, you know, start smarting off these guys. He pulls out a pistol. Turns out, these gentlemen have been into some shenanigans. They have done a little bit of robbery and got some uh, got some money, uh, probably some murder, just some, just some villainy was done. And now the double crossing begins. Uh, and so, you know, look, he uh, has the upper hand and, and he uses it. Meanwhile, you know, the n- sun comes up the next morning and there's a little, uh, you know, leaves the car that those guys were in just bloody and nasty. Um, and that's where the real story begins, right? That's where the, the actual plot takes off in this. You've got a young couple uh, and they are, number one, they have amazing fashion sense. I've never wanted a shirt with a possum on it until I read this book and mm. I need that t-shirt. <laughs> uh, but you have this young woman named Gabby and she is a young Caucasian woman. They're, they're a lesbian couple. And Gabby has inherited a cattle farm uh, from her great aunt and uncle that she was kind of estranged for. She didn't know a whole lot about them. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things, I guess, where she's the last member of the family and the lawyer hunted her down and said, hey, you, you've got this, so come do it. And, you know, this is one of those things where, in Gabby's mind, the universe has set them up to only succeed. That's that's how this works. Things are falling into place because the universe wills it to. She's kind of a free spirit. Um, her girlfriend, on the other hand, is not. Her girlfriend, you know, raised by preppers, seems to be somebody who, you know, totes around duffel bags full of protective guns. Uh, you know, not... not not assault guns, protective guns. Mm. Um, and she's, she's very much like, no, no, this is this, like, we just need to get rid of this and sell it. You know, I'm not a, everything happens for a reason person. Um, but they arrive at the farm and they start unloading boxes. And the tentative plan is to kick it here for about a year, uh, sell off the cattle, take on, you know, sell the land and just be done with it and go start their lives. This is, this is the universe setting them up for, uh, to, to be a wonderful, happy little rancher, lesbian couple who are going to go off and that, you know, this is, it's laying the gold at their feet. Um, but here's the problem. Here's the problem, Matt. You, 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 there had to be a problem, right? Um, turns out this house, this land, uh, all of it haunted, haunted as hell. Uh, there are crazy things that happen. There's, there's ghosts, there's goblins, there's UFOs. Uh, and they are not sure what they are walking in. There's even a, there's even a house poltergeist. Does your house have a poltergeist, Matt? Not as of yet. Not, we, we should work on that. Mm. We got to We got to make that happen. That could be um, problematic. 
auntie and uncle uh, apparently lived in this house for years and they set it up to be you couldn't really leave but they seem to be some type of caretakers not only of the land but of also the things that happen here uh lots of vhs lots of proof that these things exist um, but they're all hidden in the attic so inevitably our our heroes as it were our girls find this uh find this room but before they find it, you know, literally has to come and touch them, right? Uh, so late that first night, they are, you know, they, they've, they're curled up in bed. Uh, they hear the cattle outside just start screaming, just lots of mo- Also, shout out, uh, but seeing the word moo as a sound effect is hilarious to me, and I don't know why. Um, I just laughed uh, at these. And so uh, she goes out to to check, to see what's going on with the cattle, what's, what's happening there. And then something touches her on the back of the neck and it just sends her into a vision she has this out-of-body experience where she is in somebody else's uh, you know she she actually says my foot is smaller than theirs like you know so she it, it's it's almost like she's imagining herself as somebody else with a train coming to barrel to her uh, last minute she jumps out so she's having this vision right and then she sees just ghosts everywhere uh, and they're all surrounding the house Um it, the ugly, just nasty. The hues are green and yellows. Uh, you know, a UFO light opens up from the top. So all of a sudden, just this whole supernatural experience hits them at once. And they are, they're leaving, right? There's no way they're staying here. Um, except, as they learn from a video left behind by the great aunt, they have to. They can't get out. They, ha- they can't escape. They're stuck. And she apologizes profusely, but they have no options. Um and so they've got to figure out how to make this work, right? They have to figure out how to to get out of this sticky situation. The next morning, as they go back to you know kind of put everything together, they're freaked out. Um, but they had laid some groundwork to help them with this farm. Uh, and these two guys, uh, you know, the, the the quote unquote manager shows up, and he's brought two new farm hands who's going to help them out um, around the place. And then a third guy shows up, and just to bring everything full circle. It's the murderous psychopath from the beginning of the book who just whacked two people out in the woods. So lots of lots of conflict being drawn up here, lots of tension. Uh, we're going to see what happens. Uh, there, there's a lot of places that this, this can go. And here's what I love about this story, and I'm, I'm curious if it, it works for you too. We really don't understand what the main antagonist is because there's so much happening. Mm-hmm. You've, got, you've got the supernatural angle. You've got the aliens. Uh, you've got... You know, assumedly mad cow disease somewhere lurking in the background, but you also have a, a murderer um, kicked out, and then you've got this. I guess he's the king spirit himself. This this person that the ant calls the horned man, and she says, no matter what you do, no matter what happens, no you know, look, don't let the other ghosts touch you. It's fine. They can't come in the house. It's whatever. But if you see the horned man, you run. You run as far and as fast as you can. So we've got problems. We've got problems just out the wazoo for our young couple. Uh, and not to mention, again, the house poulter guys, too, is actually pretty cool. Uh, you know, helps them out. They, they hang out with him. They kind of get friendly. They're writing messages in the window. Um, there's lots of stuff that could go wrong here, and it really seems like they've got a, an uphill battle. So that is the, that's kind of the plot. Uh, if you want to uh, feel free to embellish anything that, or, or fill in any holes that I missed, um, as you kind of talk about it, but I'm going to turn things over to you, Matt. Uh, the panel where the where where she is touched in the back of the neck mm-hmm. by the ghost or whatever this uh, that was pretty horrifying. Yes, a uh, very excellent, a very excellent panel because mm-hmm. I was just reading it and then I, I was like, that that really gave me the creeps. Yeah. That is a great panel. So what what I think makes that work really well um, is that on that page on, on both of the pages because that is if you know as you were looking at it that's going to be on your right hand side. All the rest of the panels are dark. And most of the story, as far as this little part, is dark. Lots of black, some dark greens and stuff. But as the ghost reach out and touches her, the background stark white. Just blinding white, and she's got a greenish hue to it. And it really just makes that one singular panel bounce off the page as she's having this kind of electric moment. Um, I thought that was really cool. And, yeah. and that was also the series of pages that had the moo sound effects. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, I, um, I, I need more moves. Yeah, I mean, it's like, was that the horned man that touched her? Was that, you know, So I wonder, what was that? That's because well, you're left wondering. I, I, I kind of thought <clears> it was <throat> that, you know, if you like, as you just flip the page, there is a, a ghost that like half of his body has been ripped out, like his, his yeah. guts and stuff. I kind of thought that was who touched her. 
Um, but you don't know. Like, you don't know which one of these ghosts. And, you know, a few a few pages later, you see her as she runs back to the house. She's looking outside, and there's, you know, dozens of them. There's dozens of these ghosts that have now surrounded the house and are, like, you know, they, they can't get in, but they're just smashed up against the windows, uh, as it were. Uh, it's really freaking everybody out. So, who knows, but it's... it's the, the colors that they chose for those pages are really, really good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, all the artistic choices are great mm-hmm. in this. I thought I thought it was uh, funny. The uh, poltergeist, you know, writes the message on the mirror, yeah. I'm Bowden, and she immediately gives him a nickname. Yeah, Bodie. Hey, Bodie. Yeah. <laughs> it's a level of comfort uh, I don't think I would have had. That quickly they adopted. Yeah. They adopted very quickly. Um yeah, so I'm look. I love Kyle Starks. Uh, you know, I've said it before. I try to read everything that he comes out with. I I've seen Art Yom Toplin's art before. I, f- I follow them on Instagram, but this is like some next level stuff. And it kind of has that um, it, it has that feel that I'm really enjoying in horror books right now. Uh, you know, very interpretive, very sketchy. They play with negative space a lot. You know it. On a lot of these panels, it looks like they they put a bunch of colors on the page and then covered up with it with like a you know like black paint and then drew by scratching everything off. Uh, especially that the panel where the UFO light beams down and it looks like the skies just opened up. That's some really cool art art choices. It reminds me of something similar that they did in the book The Plot from last year. Mm. Um, it, like it, it's really really cool stuff. I, I can't wait to see where this goes. And, and yeah, this has been, I, I've been more excited for, I haven't been this excited to see a, to see a next issue in a long time because I don't know where it's going. Um, genuinely don't have much of a clue on what, what direction they're heading. Um, because if you read the back matter, and this is kind of what I was talking about earlier, you, this isn't necessarily a, a horror story about aliens. Or a horror story about ghosts, or even a horror story about murderers. This is a horror story about not being able to protect the people that you love, um, about being able to protect your family, uh, uh, about things that are completely out of your control. That that you know that's terrifying. That is that is something that we all think about as adults. No matter you know if you're talking about a significant other, a child, your, your parents, um, you know as you know the, the curveballs that life throws at us. There are things that we can't do anything about. Um, and th- th- that can become overwhelming. And I really think that's what Kyle was trying to, and you know, he, he says as much, but that's where he's really going with this. Um, but he's doing it through the lens of all of these really cool pop culture, terrifying, you know, things. And, and that's why I really appreciate that. He doesn't just limit this to, to one section of the genre. This isn't a slasher story. This isn't a, you know, aliens or a, you know, creepy crawly story it's it's got everything he, he took all of these things and threw them in a blender and really distilled them out to just be this to be fear to be this singular uh, idea of fear of the things that we can't control in our lives um and in that way the story be, kind of becomes claustrophobic uh at least for me it, it becomes really closed in even though there's all these places that it can go but in my brain it like it shuts itself in and it becomes this really scary little ball uh, ball of fear and emotions, and he does a really good job of of putting that down on the page. Yeah, so, um, yeah. I'm, I'm, man, I'm pumped. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I do miss seeing him on the art, though. Uh, like, th- I think this, I, I think Art Yom is perfect for this. But as I think think back to some of the stuff that Kyle Stark has done in the past, I miss seeing Kyle Stark draw. I don't think his art style would be good for a story like this. So this is what's actually funny. Um, but man, I, I really want to see him draw some more stuff. Oh yeah, uh, soon someday. Yeah, he, he's an incredible artist. Um, Rockini Mountain. Part of that was just the lines he put down. The oh page. yeah, that was so, a lot of fun. Oh, that was a lot of fun. We got to go. We should, you know, for a chaos episode someday in the future, go back and reread Rockini mm-hmm. Mountain. Yeah, because um, you know we we do stuff that's older, and we're going to do. I, I'm kind of excited about next week. Yeah, uh, wink, wink, nod, nod. Um, we're doing stuff that's considered classics, but we should revisit that. Yeah, that'd be fun. It's a good time. I love that book. Um, this is on my pull list, as are most things uh, to do with Kyle. So I should say this is part of the Image uh, line of books. That's who publishes it, but it's part of the Skybound stuff. Yeah. Um, I just, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm giddy. This is on my pull list. I can't wait for issue two. Yeah, yeah, I'm, up, I'm, I'm, up, I'm up for it. I'm yep. looking forward to seeing so, where it goes. Nice. I love it when it ends up on our pull list because that doesn't always happen. Yep. So. Well, man, tell me about a book that you have uh, that you have read this week that I can guarantee you I have not read. So I found this in a dollar bin. 
uh, recently, and this is a book I was surprised to find in a dollar bin. I've been curious about this this series for a long time. <clears throat> it's not the easiest thing to find because there's just one print run made of it, and I don't think it's been issued in a collection, but I, I may be wrong about that. This is from Image Comics from 1993. Uh, the, the, the series is called 1963 Mystery Incorporated. Uh, subtitled America's Most Exciting Comic Book. So what this Scooby-Doo-ish. what this is <clears throat> after I and I went into this I knew of this series. I've heard people talk about it, but I've never really dug into what it is because I wanted to when I finally got around to reading it, I wanted to kind of go in blind. Mm-hmm. The creative team on this, Al Moore, uh, pencils by Rick Veach, inked by Dave Gibbons, right? Holy shit. Yeah. Uh, letters by Don Simpson. Yeah. And like uh, Murderer's Row. Yeah. The, and then the colors by Marvin Kilroy, which I'm unfamiliar with Marvin Kilroy. But the creative team on this, I was I was like, oh my gosh. I mean, Dave Gibbons is doing the inks on this? On top of v- Rick V? I mean, mm-hmm. I was just like really taken aback by this. Okay. So what this is, this is a parody of Marvel in 1963. Uh, v- and it's very much a a parody of Stan Lee. Yeah. Specifically. Um, the story structure, the panel layouts, the artistic style, everything is very reminiscent of the early 60s, mm-hmm. as is the writing. Um, the narrative feels like uh, Stan Lee of its era. Mystery Incorporated is a um, analog for the Fantastic Four. Okay. From the origin to the members to the relationships of the members, the, the members' powers, very much a, an analog for the Fantastic Four. It's and it's a very this issue is a very simple story of the fan the, the, this Fantastic Four analog called Mystery Incorporated. It's just this. It's an episode where they're testing each other's powers by pitting themselves against each other in friendly ways. So there's, you know, in, in doing so you learn about the power sets of each. Mm -hmm. Well, then the female character, the genie, who is the, obviously the Sue storm analog talks about their origin, gets on a rocket ship, goes into outer space, But then it takes a very dark Al Moore turn to where instead of being bombarded by gamma rays, um, they are, they land on the moon and they find uh, at the bottom of a uh, pit, four gigantic alien statues. And when they inspect this area of which they can't, you know, they, they don't know if this is, uh, you know, guarding some secrets. If it's an ancient religious site, it's got, but it's got a very HP Lovecraft feel to it, mm-hmm. which Al Moore is an enormous HP right. Lovecraft. So, so is Rich Veach. I mean, yeah. So it goes from Gamma Race to this very dark, <laughs> ancient Elder Gods feel. And that's where they get their powers, which I just thought was, there's a funny little deviation. But the story, you know, again, the story <clears throat> just kind of goes on. It's got that very much that 1963 feel. So what Al Moore also did is he did a parody of Stan's Soapbox, for those of you that were old enough to remember those. Yep. And the titles of the this what is amazing. So the title, instead of calling it Stan's Soapbox, the title of this one page, a little prose, is Sensational 63 Sweatshop Section. Sensational 63 Sweatshop Section, a pageant of possibly pointless postings from the Parlor of Perfection. <laughs> and then there's just paragraph after paragraph of like, here's a title of you know one of the paragraphs. The Shameless 63 Shopping List, a month-by-month memorandum of must-have merchandise. There's another one. Al's Amphitheater, in which our lovable leader lightens the load of Lumpen proletariat in a learned lecture laden with lucidity, laughter, and love. It's <laughs> and reading this, just like the alliteration Olympics, 
reading this, I was laughing so hard I had tears in my yeah. eyes. This is a these Stan Soapbox parodies are freaking spot on yeah. and hilarious. You know, you know, to give a little bit of background here, Al Moore was not a fan of Stan Lee. No. And specifically, he was not a fan of Marvel Comics. Uh, he was a huge torchbearer for Jack Kirby mm-hmm. and Jack Kirby's, you know, the way, you know, his, his treatment from Marvel comics. Um, and this is poking some fun at that, uh, cutting in wrestling par parlance, cutting some promos. And frankly, I mean, you know, I am not one and never have been one to beat up on Stan Lee yeah. for his mistakes and some of those things he did that I didn't care for because conversely he did a hell of a lot of good for yeah. the for the business. So, you know, I've never but I can't help but th- I'm sorry, this is too good. It is so funny. I cannot recommend this enough. And uh I'm going to it's just and it and glad I found this because I've been it's been on my, the series has been on my radar and it's only, I believe maybe six issues and, uh, it's been on my radar for a long time. I've just never taken the time to track them down. But after reading this, I have got to get the rest of these and read them. Uh, the other standouts in this, this is, this is amazing. So there's also a letters column. (laughs) Okay. So as a reminder, this is issue number one, but this letters column is a straight up, Again, uh, parody on the Marvel's letter columns of old. Okay, so I went through and read these quote unquote letters to the to the creators, mm-hmm. and the first one starts off with, "Dear Al and Rick, boy, your comics sure are great. Me and my brother buy every one of the books each month, and not only one, not only the ones with super guys in. We also read your War and Wild West comics." And then he goes on to name those. And so that's led issue number one. Obviously a young young man, young boy and his brother talking about how they much love the books. Letter number two. Dear Al, Rick, and Dave, although I am a student attending college here in Miami, you'll be surprised to learn that I avidly collect your comic books and that I have every issue of Mystery Incorporated since number one. So college student. Uh, number three. Three on the letters column page. Dear Affable Al, Roaring Rick, Dashing Dave, Dandy Dan, Meticulous Murphy, Mirthful Melinda, and everyone else in the Screwball 63 sweatshop. The sweatshop is what is referred to instead of the bullpen. Yeah. yeah. For those of you that are unfamiliar. As one of your devoted female writer readers... I'm writing in response to Mike Milo's letter in issue 17. How dare he say such mean things about the neon queen as for saying that she is only good for one thing, i.e. turning into fluorescent gas. He could not be more wrong. Over the years, there have been many occasions when Jeannie's quick wits and sensitive personality have saved the team from certain doom, as when she flirted with the underman's troll century in order to escape the underground prison back in issue 11. With her brains, beauty, Jeannie is an asset to any team, and I definitely vote for you for your to keep her in Mystery Incorporated where she belongs." My only complaint is that you should stop making her choose between Craig and Tommy and give her a real boyfriend. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. Then, again, um, the letters continue. Uh, Dear Al and the gang, I'm a great fan of all your comic books, and since I one day hope to be a comic book artist worthy to sit at the feet of the great Roaring Rick Veach, I sent away for a duplicated amateur magazine about comics that I saw advertised. Da, 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 da. I admit that there was a lot of stuff in the interview that I maybe didn't understand. Like, for example, what does work for hire mean? <laughs> <laughs> and then the answers, and there's answers to these letters yeah. as well. The writer of that letter was named Ralph. Of course it was. So yeah. the answer to the to this letter, Ralph we bet our bottom dollar on it, especially when we reveal that Roaring Rick Veach rib-tickling rant 
was just another example of the screwy, scatterbrained sense of silliness that's all part of slaving in the sensational 63 sweatshop. The roaring one was indulging in some good nature and joshing by ribbing affable Al about the perennial pesky pranks that our lovable leader persistently pulls around the office, like handing out a wacky gag contracts for everyone to sign. As for the, ma- the magnificently mysterious motto, work for hire, let the serried ranks of 63dom hereby receive notice that hire is the nickname for handsome Hiram Glick, our swinging septuagenarian voucher clerk. You see, whenever one of our prodigious pencilers or imitatable inkers, how you like that, mm-hmm. uh, finishes a job, he has to fill out a voucher for Hiram to process, which is, of course, making additional work for hire, even though the cheery old codger never utters a word complaint. Yeah. There's, yeah. Yeah. This is Alan Moore. <laughs> yeah. And then the final, le- you know, the final letter on here that I, that got me, this is the one that got me. Dear sirs, although I'm a rocket scientist employed by NASA, you'll have no doubt be surprised to learn that I'm a regular reader of your comic magazine, which I admire for its accuracy of detail and explanation of scientific matters, in which I'm happy to pass on to my three children as suitable fare for their growing minds. However, over recent months, I have become increasingly distressed by your depiction of scientists as wacky, mad, or deranged in some way. As with your character, Dr. Apocalypse, as a scientist, as a scientist myself, how can I expect my children to respect either myself or my profession when you characterize scientists and doctors as being eccentric and bent on destroying the world? Also, a Devolvo Ray would be unable to function in the way that you describe, with beings dwindling away to nothing, uh, since this would violate the fundamental laws of the universe and that the, <laughs> and that the beings' surplus, surplus mass would have nowhere to go. A more efficient and logical means of reducing human beings to incoherent masses of random protoplasm would be an application of genetic engineering, although this would take between three or four generations to achieve the desired effect. But, so, so, I mean, like... Where does Alan Moore find the time? <laughs> I mean, this they, these letters. I mean, what's fu- realizing that the letters yeah. progress: child, female reader, college student, and then finally it ends with rocket yeah. scientists. Yeah. And every letter is. You'd be surprised to know right. that I am. A, it's like it's like desperate validation yeah. in printing these letters. And they're. I mean, it's amazing. And I, I was. I just had tears in my eyes reading that final one about the rocket scientist. And then there's fake advertisements. There's a fake advertisement on the back um, about from a guy um, a, 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 a trying to peddle lessons on how to speak proper English. Mm-hmm. And it's, I mean, if you have read these old comic books and you have some, you have some knowledge of these old advertisements, this will this is just, just laugh out kidding. loud funny. You may think it's funny anyway, but if you have the context of reading the old ad- ridiculous advertisements in these old comic books, these are hysterical yeah. to read. And this one on the back is called Shamed by... <laughs> it's, the title is Shamed by You English. You can speak soon and write like college graduate if me let you help for a day for 15 minutes. Uh, the... This is an advertisement by one Dan Bolio, Missouri University of Verbatim. Uh, he has a bachelor's uh, from Hoboken University, director of Linguage Institute Method Authority on Adult Educating. And it's a long question and answer, you know, um, uh, <laughs> back and more. forth in the advertisement as they used to do. But the one that got me is because these are like questions a customer might pose. Right. Question. Wait a minute. Why in God's name would I write to a comic book to enroll in a correspondence course to learn better English? Answer. What? You know want to learn how to use exclamation points very many times in one sentence? Just. Plus, <laughs> you how learn to emphasize big important words erratic like manner, much like me. <laughs> it's just... Yeah. So, so what what year did you say this came out? Ninety three. Ninety three. Um, so that would have been after Rich Veach did Brat Pack. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. It's like so. You, you mentioned a while ago, like you said, you don't. You're you're not a person, and neither am I. To you know, to to beat up against Stan Lee, it's it's way more nuanced than than what you know the average person I think is is capable of talking about it. But you you don't have to um, you know buy into something wholesale just to appreciate it, right? Like you don't have to buy into it just to just to understand that this is really funny parody. 
Um, yeah. And it's also, you know, Stan Lee yeah. did really well for himself. Oh, so, you know, uh, he can take some criticism. Yeah. Oh, and, and this is not, I mean, just remember, this is some professional criticism. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. This isn't like yeah. making fun of his family or something. No, this, this is this is levied at yeah. what he did as as, as yeah. the the cheerleader for yeah. for Marvel. Yeah. Um, and you know, look, it's funny though in, in the light of certain th- like knowing Alan Moore, like his mindset when he wrote this versus Alan Moore's mindset today, where he's just like throwing his hands in the air and it's just you know he's just done with it. He's just done with everything. It's it's funny. It's interesting to watch that journey in of itself too. Uh, it's it's fascinating. Yeah. Like it's, I, I, I personally can't wait to in, in the future, and there's already been some, but in the future there's going to be some really really cool scholarly works done. Yeah. Um, that that study Alan Moore, um, in the way that they you know a, a book came out last year, um, the year before last about uh, Stan Lee. I haven't read it yet. I need to. I've still got it on my shelf. Um, you got Zach Krusey's uh, book on Ditko that came out, which by the way is nominated for an Eisner. Mm, um, nice. So that's awesome. Uh, and so I, I can't wait for that, that work to be done just because stuff like this is going to be included in it. Like this helps you understand who Alan Moore was. And, and I think you also have to like, obviously he wrote this. There's a level of sarcasm. I think that's intended here. Like it's, <laughs> I mean, course, well, yeah. Yeah, but, but you know what I mean? Like you, you could read this and say, okay, not only is there sarcasm, but Alan Moore just really fucking hated it. Like, you know, would have shot the dude in the back of the head. I think you read this too, and you like it's funny. Like there, there's a loathing here, but it's a humorous. Loathing. It's almost Howard Shaken level loathing, where he's mm-hmm. he's made the loathing into a joke. Um, oh, he's definitely made the loathing into a joke. Yeah, yeah. that's that. It's just it's funny to me. Um, cracks me up. I love that stuff like this exists. Yeah, I mean the. I can't wait to read the other issues. It's also hilarious to me that, and just again, knowing what year this was written in, that the, it came out from Image, from all those dudes who were just disgruntled as fuck at Marvel. Mm. Oh yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, that's that's funny, man. Where where did you where did you get this issue at? Did you find it in the long box at the comic shop? Or did you order I it? found this um, in a dollar bin in a in um, where was I? I was in Oklahoma City. Mm-hmm. And I had about 30 minutes to kill, uh, so I Googled comic book shops nearby yeah. and found a comic book, sl- comic book slash sneaker shop. Huh. So I walk in. It's a little store. On one corner was comic books, and the other corner was shoes. And uh, That is an interesting niche market. It was, a, it, was, it was quite the thing, yeah. So this was one of the things that was in that dollar bin. That's badass, dude. That is that is the one thing, you know, back when I, before I went to school, uh, before I started back to college, when I worked for, you know, as a, as a contractor, essentially for the government, um, or I worked for a contractor that contracted with the government, I should say, uh, getting to travel, getting like getting to go to places like Boise, Idaho, uh, you, you know, Virgi- all up in Virginia and everywhere else. I don't get to see the little local comic shops mm. you get to explore them anymore. That was cool. I would always come back with like a short box mm. after a month of stuff just that I grabbed from places. So nice. Low key, a little jealous that you get to, <laughs> I mean, I'm not jealous of the actual traveling that you have to do. Cause I know that it's exhausting, but I'm a little jealous that you get to go to places that aren't here. Yeah. Every once in a while I find one that's good. I, f- <laughs> I found one a few months ago that now he did not offer, he did not have new comic books. Mm-hmm. He only, he only bought collections. Yeah. And it was a pop culture shop. He had a tons of stuff and comics included, lots of comics. But the place smelled so strongly of a litter box. Yeah. I, 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 unfortunately, I don't want to go back because I smelled like yeah. I smelled like a litter box the rest of the day, yeah. which is a shame because he had a ton of stuff at great prices. And I'm like, well, I can't go back there, you know, because I'll stink. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, because I, I go to I go to this place and it's in a rough part of town because as I'm following my little GPS, I'm like, I'm like, OK, is there. So I pull up and it's got a plywood door. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say that was in Tulsa or Oklahoma? This City? was Oklahoma City. Okay, so yeah, I've been to that shop. I know exactly what okay. you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was gonna say if it was in Tulsa, I'm like, yeah, no, that dude has a brother who lives in OK City. Uh, <laughs> but, okay. Yeah. Um, no, I know exactly, and it is unfortunate because no, I, I, I mean, I'm not gonna get on a soapbox or anything, but like, it just damages your business. Like, of you're, course, you're to be yeah, a businessman. Um, it also damages the reputation of the community. You, you know, when it, I don't like think that. he's doing any harm to that community. <laughs> well, no, I mean, us in general. I mean, that's why, you know, you say, I think even today they're more accepted. But, you know, you tell people I like comics and the first thing they think of is like the comic book guy from The Simpsons. 
Mm. Uh, you, you know, it's it, it's just frustrating. Mm. So, but I, I am jealous that you get to travel around and see some cool shit. So, uh, for whatever it's worth, it doesn't happen very often. I see some stuff, but I don't see the cool <laughs> stuff very often. <laughs> Emphasis on shit, not, yeah. not much of yeah. cool. Um, well, I'm glad you went to something old. I'm going to go to something new. I'm going to bring us back to a little DC Comics action. Um, I'm actually curious. Are you reading Superman, Son of kal Nope. Nope. Um, fun story. Mm. Re- really fun story in general. Uh, the, and, and I mean, number one, the creative team really, really drives home that this is going to be great. But it's Tom Taylor uh, who's mm. writing it. Um, and that guy just... What a powerhouse. Like, you know, he and he and Donnie Cates really are just doing some really incredible work right now. For, for young writers who kind of came on the scene for the last five years, um, just winning all across the board. Uh, but so, yeah, this is this is Tom Taylor. Um, art by Tormy. Uh, Frederico Bleed does the does the colors. Does a beautiful job at this. Um, the best way I can start this story off is by just saying... Batman's a dick. Mm. Um, but he, he, he just <laughs> Batman. Batman's a dick. His people skills are lacking. not the sharpest. They're, yeah, they're, they're lacking. Um, great detective, but you know, kind of can't read the room for shit uh, sometimes. But the the reason I say that in the past issue, and I'm going to talk about issue eleven here, but in issue ten, at the end of the issue, uh, Batman comes up and he's talking to he's talking to Superman who again this is Jonathan this is not you mm-hmm. know Clark is still out of the picture Jonathan is Superman right now and Jonathan is he's been dating um, and this caused a lot of you know they got a lot of internet attention um, I, I'm gonna say attention because I've refused to focus on the bad things but got a lot of news because Superman came out uh, you know Jonathan Kent is at least bisexual if not gay and has started dating this guy Um named Jay Nakamura and Jay is a he's a journalist that runs this thing called The Truth actually um, now Jonathan's mom uh, you know the the amazing Lois Lane the winner of all the awards it has been doing some work with him to mm-hmm. uncover all kinds of things that's going on um, in the story uh, which you know we'll get to here shortly but um, John also has a little bit of a history with some fringe elements uh, mm-hmm. you know as part of an activist uh, activist group and so he was he was connected to a group called the Revolutionaries. And Batman Batman seems to think that they were violent extremists. Mm. Um, now this group was a they were a group of super powered people. They they did not have Batman's rules. I mean like they, they killed people, but it was kind of only the people who at least in their mind um, needed killing. Mm. Um, sometimes that was extra you know, obviously all the time that was extrajudicially, but you know, Batman also hangs out with some other seedy people. Like, it's, it, reading the story, it's hard for me to think about. Oh, well, you've got this, you've got this viewpoint of of these other these revolutionaries, but like, you know, Midnighter's kicking around with Nightwing. Like, you know, kind of like Midnighter will murder <laughs> like mm-hmm. you know, bad people, but he makes that decision himself. So it was really a little weird that he took that stance, but Batman's delivered the message, and and John's not wanting to hear it. Number one, because he's that this is boyfriend, right? Like there's a lot of mixed emotions in there. The guy, the, you know, the kids, the kids young doesn't want to believe anything bad could happen. But, um, you know, he's, he's, it, this is also bucking back against the adults in the room. Right. Um, and so he kind of just gets upset at the messenger. Um, and, and to be fair, Batman, his communication skills, as we, we know are, are lacking. He does not deliver this message in the most, comforting like in the best way this is more of a rip the band-aid off situation it's like no, no your boyfriend's a terrorist you can't trust him we gotta lock him <laughs> like, I'm, I'm gonna arrest him forever mm. um, throw him in the pit and john just gets up and flies off um this is where the story takes a really heartfelt turn um this conversation is happening in a cabin uh you know kind of off in the middle of nowhere it's a safe house and the reason they're there is because with some of the stuff that's happened in the story um lex luther and uh, Henry Bendix have kind of teamed up. Bendix is now running his own country. Uh, he, he's this evil Machiavellian leader. Lex Luthor is Lex Luthor. Um, they are doing some shady shit, as you might imagine, uh, including having been the like been the reason that Jay Nakamura has a certain set of powers. Like they were experimenting on people, uh, and so that's there's, that's the main tension of the book. They're going back and forth. John is. Uh, disrupted some stuff that Bendix's country and Bendix was doing with his country. So uh, again, national elements, uh, all kinds of craziness. That led to Ma and Pa Kent's house being attacked because Clark, um, at least before this, uh, let it know that he was Superman. Clark Kent is Superman. So they traced it back to Ma and Pa Kent. 
um, and Mom Pa Kent's house got hit by a missile. <laughs> um, nice little smoking crater. So, but they were they were out. Like they weren't. They didn't get killed. And so Batman's got them set up in a safe house. Um, pa Kent comes out and brings Batman a cup of. I'm assuming tea because it's it's nighttime. Could be coffee. You know, Batman seems like a guy who enjoys a good cup of Joe no matter what time of the day it is. Um, not much of a sleeper that guy. But he, you know, Pa Kent hands him this mug. Um, by the way. <laughs> It's it's a it's a mug that says world's best mom. So while this whole conversation's happening, Batman's drinking out of a world's best mom. Mug. Nice. Um, and it just says, you know, he's kind of talking to him, fatherly figure to fatherly figure. Uh, because while Clark is gone, you know, Bruce is a little bit of a father figure, um, not only to the Bat family, but you know, to John too. Like he's he's there to help, and, and it's his best friend's son. Why wouldn't he be? And he just you know, Batman he, and Superman are best friends. Uh, kind of. Um, oh. in, in modern, yeah, well, I mean, you know, in modern world, they're really close. I, I don't know if you could say that they are best friends, but like they, they, they close, they talk, um, mm. they, they, they are kind of tight in, in modern, in the modern DC universe. Um, so they're, he's out there and, and Pa Kent's kind of scolding, scolding him a little bit for how he just delivered that message. And he's basically explaining to him, he's like, dude, you, you've raised kids. You, you know what that's like. Um, <laughs> you know, you, Has he seen how he did it? Well, the, <laughs> he makes some really funny points. But he says you, you have to let them make mistakes. And then, you, you know, he, he was... <laughs> so, so Pa Kent goes, I mean, dude, you, you're a full-grown superhero. Um, and also, you know, Alfred and I talk and... Alfred told me you almost married Catwoman. And Batman's like, that, you know, people make mistakes. You can't be just going around just making judgment calls for everybody. He's like, that's hardly the point. And he goes, is Damien's mom an assassin? And he was like, yeah. <laughs> so just this kind of like, oh, shit, yeah. So, and where I say this is a very heartfelt conversation, besides the fact there is some, you know, advice from fatherly figure to fatherly figure, it turns out that Pa Kent and Alfred had a very close relationship. And that's kind of established here. Um, because of the, there are two people, you know, Pa Kent is the son of, or is the father of Superman. Um, Alfred is Batman's dad for all intents and purposes. They knew each other and they talked, uh, you, you know, behind the scenes. They would, they would comfort each other. They would give each other advice. They would talk about these things. Unbeknownst to Batman, mm-hmm. unbeknownst to Superman, they had this relationship before Alfred died. And number one, you know, a, a tear in your eye. Pa Kent just looked like, tells Bruce, is like, dude, you have no idea how proud of you that Alfred was. Uh, you know, all of his fears, all of the disagreements set aside, he was proud of you. Hmm. And so beautiful, beautiful moment. Um, that, that alone, that conversation is worse, uh, is worth the price of admission. At the end of it, he just says, you know, look, I know you disagree with me. I know you have thoughts about, uh, Jonathan and, and Superman, but out of the two of us, which one has more experience in raising a Superman? Um, you gotta let, you gotta let the kids make mistakes. And if there is something sinister going on with Jay, um, then he'll find out. It'll break his heart, but he'll find out. Like, he, he is Superman. He is such a guarded person because he is the most powerful person on the planet right now that, that Clark is gone. He knows that. So so give the kid a break a little bit. Um, but I mentioned earlier that John had flown off in kind of a tough. Uh, he calls his buddy Nightwing. Um, Jonathan and Nightwing, uh, after a, a crossover recently, they talk now. They're, they're cool. Uh, you're really good friends. He's like, hey, I need some advice. I'm coming to, to Bloodhaven. Um, at the time, you know, Nightwing's bas- ba- 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 bouncing around fighting some um, arsonists. He's like, you know, you mind if, I, mind if I give you a assist? He's like, yeah, sure. He's like, you sure? I don't want to step on your toes. And he's like, no, it's all, more the merrier. It's always welcome. Superman comes in, uh, you know, blows out all the fire, arrests the arsonists. And he kind of lays out what Bruce uh, has told him to, to Dick, right? Uh, and he was like, I just, you know, Bruce thinks I need to go confront him and whatever. And Dick is just like, hmm. Have you tried just talking to the guy? <laughs> um, you know, it's your boyfriend, right? Like, go talk to him. Find out what's going on. So he does. Um, and, you know, he, he walks in the house and the the, the apartment that, that's also serving as the Truth's headquarters. He's like, hey, you know, we need to talk. Here's what Batman told me. And, you know, Nakamura's just like, that's, that's why he doesn't like me. Um, I was wondering why he was giving me the stink eye the whole time. I guess he's heard about that. But, you know, and, and he lays out, like, these guys were not evil guys like the people that they hurt the, the the revolutionaries people that they killed were were trafficking in humans they were they were doing these deplorable things and so yeah they 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 existed on the outskirts they were kind of like you know a red hood type figure but it's what they did um so if he wants to get mad about that that's fine but again like look at all these other people that he hangs out with it's kind of shitty that he would do that to me but i appreciate the fact that you came and talked to me about this that's good for our relationship um but then something dings in superman's head um, in a previous issue, he took 
this superpowered person um, prisoner. Uh, this is part of a a squad of heroes. Quote, I'm using air quotes when I say that. That work for Bendix and his uh, bad guy. T- you know his 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 nation. Um, they recently had to fight this Leviathan type creature in in Metropolis's Bay, uh, and one of that team got killed and they go back and watch the video and they realize like they zoom in and they see this dude's face the dude is terrified but he's frozen and this person had super speed he should have been able to get out of the way and he can't like they realize he can't move they do some digging and they find out that this group of superpowered people that showed up working for bendix that also lex luther is trying to posit to the uh, the american people as you know this this foreign great pe- group of people that you know do what superman should couldn't do and all the heroes from the justice league can't do um, they uncover that Bendix and, and Luther have planted uh, computer chips in their brain that allow them to control them and shut up. You know, it's it's an old school trope. It, we we see that a lot. It's very similar to Suicide Squad. You know, but it, it works. It, it's one that works. And so they go. That they've got one of these figures uh, locked up in the Hall of Justice, and they realize that oh, if they can control him, he does not need to be in the Hall of Justice because not only. Can they use it to control their motor skills? They can make them blow up. Like like it's like a mini nuclear weapon sitting inside a jail cell in the Hall of Justice. So they've got to either unplug it, turn it off, or get him the fuck out. Um, so they go to the one person you know that can really do a good job at that, shrink down to a molecular level and get it out, the atom. Um, and the atom does the Ant-Man thing where he shrinks down, jumps through the ear canal, and goes into the brain and is working on it. But he's not fast enough. And so the Flash has to come in, get everybody out, um, and and the dude's going supernova while this happens, um, and and they're like, no, dude, you've got to kill him. You got to like, we it's going to blow. But that's not John, right? Like John finds the way to save people because he's his father's son. Um, he grabs him and launches just as you know, supersonic up into the atmosphere where this guy uh, can't emoliate, um, where the oxygen's thin, and in just the blink of an eye, does like laser eye microsurgery to get this thing out, you know, just quick thinking, quick on his feet to eliminate this threat, brings him back down to the ground and where he can explain everything. It's like, Hey, we didn't want to do any of that. Um, it's fascinating. It, it really lays out the heart that John has, um, and the, the, the risk that he will put himself in, um, to save others. Of course, Bendix and Luther very quickly realized that homeboy didn't explode. Um, and so they've got to like, they're, they're going to launch into bad guy action very quickly. But this, this series is phenomenal. Um, John, like the way that they are positioning John to be, to be Superman, but to, to not be his father, but to have taken the best lessons from his father is, is, is brilliant. So I would argue that he's well, and Tom Taylor is the one that wrote Superman killing Joker. So yeah, yeah, I, I don't like that. Yeah, that's a but major was, that fail. Was that, was, that wasn't main continuity, right? That was that was side continuity, it was, wasn't it? I mean, yeah. I mean, that's an out to some people, but it's yeah. not for me. I mean, it's yeah. That's, I, that's fair. I mean, it's to have now. Yeah, yeah. First of all, yeah, to have Superman murder somebody. Yeah. that speaks for itself, but. You know, of course, and now you've got his son that's in a relationship with a vigilante murderer akin to the Punisher. Really? Well, so so it's not it's not that like the 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 Nakamura is is was never doing the killing. He wasn't part of that group. He was just connected to him. So he was never part of that vigilante group. He just his whole talking about John, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. He he the the guy that John is dating was not one of them. Just the work that he did put him in those concentric circles. Uh, with them, um, but he was never a member of that. But it, it, it's weird because it's you know it's, it's a couple issues of explanation. But um, Nakamura has certain powers um, that he got in the same way the revolutionaries did because they were experimented on by by Bendix um, by it, from the nation of Gomorrah, uh, right? And so and his mom got kidnapped with him. So, but he he did not take part in those extracurricular activities. He just knew of them and kind of reported on them. So, and was friends with those guys, but that's how he's connected to him. But that's what led Batman to him. So he's not, he's not dating a, a Punisher esque type person or a red hood esque type person. Um, he's microchip kind of. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's a, that's a really, yeah. 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 A little bit, mm. not, not quite as cynical as microchip, <laughs> obviously, mm. but um, no, dude, I, like I said, I really enjoy this. Um, plus, you know, me being a fan of, uh, the authority 
uh, and all those in Wildstorm, um, seeing Bendix come back and take full force, uh, becoming a character in the DC universe um, in a way that we haven't seen him in a while. Uh, in a well, at least since the New Fifty Two, that Authority run, um, you know, seeing him juxtaposed with Lex Luthor, seeing those two evil assholes work together, um, kind of terrifying, uh, but it's fun. And what I like about this story is that it's kind of split in two, right? Like you get. Um, for somebody like me who likes a, f- <coughs> bless you. Sorry. No, you're good. For somebody like me who likes, uh, you know, both the heroics of superhero stories and the moral, the moralisms that can come with it. Uh, you know, this really grounded writing. The book kind of splits in half. Like you get those those really human moments, and then you get an adventure where. Superman is hanging out with Wally and the Atom, and they shrink the Atom down, and he has to go scope through somebody's ear. Like you get those classic elements. Mm-hmm. The, the book, the book has got a lot, a lot of good stuff, and I just I like seeing the growth of both, both John Kent and Anne and Damian. For somebody who's such a big fan of of the Super Sons, I like seeing where they come from, mm-hmm. um, and, and where those kids are going, and how they're being fleshed out. So, um, it's it's cool. Uh, like I said, I I think you you would like the. I think you would find find a lot of stuff to be interested in in this story, and I think other readers would as well. Like mm. it's 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 young, it's fresh, but it's still classic, kind of, mm. if that makes sense. Um, <laughs> plus, you get Bendix screaming, "Terminate, terminate, terminate!" Mm. Uh, it's fun stuff. So um, go check it out. Um, highly highly recommend it. So DC is doing some really good work right now. Mm. Really, really good work right now. Um, I'm reading zero DC at the moment. I, dro- I dropped everything DC. Really? Yeah. The only thing I'm re- you know, one exception to that is um, the um, Batman the Night yeah, limited yeah. series that's going on right now. It's the only DC book I'm buying. Okay. I'll money. get back on Batman when Zdarsky in the new ten, um, you know, he starts writing and that yeah. new team starts. But I, I don't know if I'll stay on it because DC has jacked the price up of their books. Yeah. They're giving you 80% of a Batman story, 20% of whatever they feel like doing that month. No, oh, it's for, leftover stuff from the 5G yeah. or whatever. So, yeah. you know, I'm just, yeah, I'm out. See, that's but I'm going to give them another shot. I mean, I'm not, I'm, you know, they do no, what they sure. want. I'm just not holding a grudge. I'm just not going to, you know. Well, and there's several black, black label books that you've read in the past, too. Yeah, right? I mean, I'll buy one-offs here and there. Yeah. <clears throat> but I'm not reading anything. Uh, you know, there's there's nothing I'm picking up on a regular basis every week. So I'm kind of coming from the opposite direction. I've cut down on a lot of Marvel, and I'm reading a lot more DC than I have, ever have before. Mm. Um, and and I really don't know what. I mean, these things ebb and flow. No, like sure. Talked about yeah. in the past, but you know, I grew up a, a Marvel head. You me know, too. You know, the Avengers was my shit, and that made me kind of a Marvel zombie. And part of, maybe that's part of why I'm liking what's happening in DC so much is because I'm I'm getting to tap into so many other characters that I'm not familiar mm-hmm. with or, or, or that I'm familiar with but I've never really read a lot of. Yeah. Um. So I, when I flip through my 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 stack, there's a lot of DC in there where historically that's not. Uh, Marvel. I'm I'm you know I'm I'm still reading the Avengers because I'm a completist. Thor and, <laughs> and Hulk um, are. I'm reading both of those right now. One of those is spectacular. The other one is, is entertaining, but it's it's not doing a whole lot. Um, and there's there's four or five other books that I'm reading, but the, nothing's really grabbing me over there, and I don't know why. Um, yeah, I mean, right. I mean, things were going. There were a few titles that were really hot with Marvel for a few years. Um, now, you know. I've you know I'm still looking forward to a lot of the books that I get from Marvel, but. Um, I don't know. It feels like personally, uh, you know, I'm not speaking for everybody personally. I feel like I'm a little bit of a lull. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's some good stuff coming out over there, but you know, there was some great stuff coming, you know, if you want to go back about five years up Mm -hmm. until about a year ago, but these things happen. I mean, that this is the way the business works with any, any creation, you're going to have peaks, you're going to have valleys. Yeah. It, it, that's just how everything works. Well, no, you know, nobody bats a thousand. Obviously, the X Men and stuff like that too. And I think that's that's part of it too. Is that as as creators and stuff? Because that's I I feel like really that's where I follow. And I, you know, I'm not sure about you, but I follow a lot of creators more so than I follow titles. And it seems like you know when when one corner is strong, they shift some of the better creators over there. Um, well, I I say that, but like you know, two years ago you had both Hickman doing X Men stuff. You guys were gushing <clears throat> nonstop about Zadarsky's Daredevil stuff. Yeah. You had Immortal Hulk happening at once, so it was really more all across the board. But right now, it seems like the strongest points to me are just X books um, at Marvel because that's most of what I'm 
I'm getting other than just a few other other titles. There's a lot of them too. Yeah, that's true. So, <laughs> um, but you know, it's it's just one of those things. Um, there's there's a lot of good stuff out there too, and they are expensive. So you can only read so much, and you know, only have time of the day to read so much. Yeah. So. Well, dude, I thoroughly enjoyed this, as I always do. I want to thank you personally again for opening up uh, your little home studio to us. Uh, I, I say little. This place is awesome. Um, <laughs> your home studio so we can record these things. Loved hearing about the books you read. Uh, can't wait to go home and read some more. Um, for those of you who are listening to the show, we appreciate it yet again. Um, do us a solid. Do us a favor. We'll really appreciate it. Uh, tell your friends. That's the best thing you can do. Share us on Facebook if you're on, your, on whatever social media you have. Word of mouth makes these things uh, grow more so, I think, than most things. Um, because we as a quote-unquote geek community tend to trust the people that we hang out with to give us insight into things that we might be missing out on. So tell your friends. Uh, and, and if you can, leave us a rating and review on whatever podcasting platform you download this from. Um, in the meantime... As, as is usually the case when there's not a global pandemic roaring, when Tuesdays and Wednesdays are new comic book days, and there's new stuff about to hit the shelf. And so we are going to give you a little little look forward into what we might be grabbing this next week. Matt, you want to you wanna drop something on the kids? Yeah, so Devil's Reign Omega, number one. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, this is from Marvel. Uh, the um, creative team on this is listed as various, but amongst them is Chip Zdarsky and uh, Raphael De La Tour. Uh, and this is in the wake of the most visceral daredevil named Marvel story ever, says the advertisement. That's a that's a that's a pretty big uh, that's a pretty big meatball hanging yeah, out there. Yeah, it is. Uh, the Marvel Universe's New York City stands remade and reforged, if not in Wilson Fisk's image than at the very least in his spirit. After a battle that nearly tore the city and its citizens apart, New York's superheroes have no choice but to try to adapt to a new world, excuse me, a new and dangerous paradigm they find themselves operating under, with eight million people turned against them. Hmm. Dun, dun, dun. I wonder how much I need to have been, because I'm not quite caught up on... The Dare, Daredevil run. How much of that do you think I have to have read before I can dive into that? I mean, it's a hard question to answer. Having not read, yeah. It. I mean, I, I wouldn't read this without finishing that run, frankly. Okay. I mean, for I think the kind of reason kind of speaks for itself. Yeah. It follows that run, but the run, you know, it's interesting. You know, where the the setting is is the quote the the quote unquote public, mm-hmm. you know, is against vigilanteism right now. So these characters operating in that world you know are they going to try to win the public back how successful will they be yada 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 yeah it's a it's a it's an interesting kind of a um it's, it's an interesting dynamic dynamic for these uh, characters to be operating in in new york yeah well all right well normally uh i would do kind of like just like you did and drop a new number one on it but i'm actually going to drop a number three on 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 you and everybody listening um, because I haven't spoken about it yet, because uh, I missed the first issue, I'm just now getting caught up. But um, I would encourage everybody to go grab the first, second, and what will be the third issue of Godzilla versus the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Mm. That's happening over at IDW right now. And so it's really funny that I'm, I'm. It's the creative team that brings me to this book. It really is because I'm not a long term uh, MMPR fan. I'm not really a Godzilla fan. I like the, I like everything just fine. I don't have anything against them, but I've never really you know, been the flag bearer for either one of those corners of pop culture. But this is being written by Cullen Bunn. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, hang on, because it gets better. Like, I know what you're saying. There's no way it can get better, but it does. (laughs) Uh, It gets better because it's being drawn by Freddie Williams II. Nice. So you've got Cullen Bunn and Freddie II kicking all kinds of ass. Freddie, Freddie Williams loves these kind of crossover pop culture books that you wouldn't expect. I mean, he's done a couple of them that have been really, really good. So I'm... I'm excited, and I can't. I'm saddened that I missed when it first came out because mm. I would have already spoken about this. But I'm going to try to to bring it back. So, um, it's it's just kind of what you think. Uh, you know, it's Godzilla and the Power Rangers. So you're going to get Godzilla fighting the Mechazords. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I don't know what else to say. That you know, if that doesn't entice you to pick it up, um, the creative team should have. So go pick up Godzilla versus the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers number three um, and one and two. Because it, it'll be good for your health. It'll be good for your health. It'll make you a better person. Oh, wow. It's, yeah. 
it will heal your soul. Oh will, my god! Wow. It will my, mend old wounds. I, mm. I don't know. I'm, Colin Bunn's just worth reading. So, all right, you ready to to end this thing? I think so. Call it. All right. Um, again, we we thank you for listening to this. Come back and see us next time, same time, same place. Um, if you have any comments or questions, uh, you want to see what we're reading, follow us on Instagram and Twitter. We're at SFG Podcast on both of those. You can fire off an email to us at southernfriedgeekery at gmail.com. We would really appreciate hearing from you. Um, if nothing further, kids, go uh, go forth and love some comics. Word. I, I don't know why that sounded like a question. Um, <laughs> can, I, can I try that? So to <laughs> failure pile in a sadness bowl over here. Go forth and love comics. Yeah, directed. Yeah. <laughs>